Thomas Moore, it's great to see you again. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Mark. My pleasure. So I'd like to talk to you today about pleasure, uh, sensuality, and awakening, spirituality. You've said that pleasure stops the world uh, and prepares an individual to be more receptive to the uh, nuances of the environment and to reverie and reflection. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the connection between sensory pleasure, carnal experience, and the wisdom journey? I think they're very important. Uh, both of them are very important and important to keep them together. That's the trick, to be able to, uh, to be, able to be uh, devoted to a kind of sensual being in the world at the same time to be able to transcend that all. You know, it's, it's a paradox. But uh, on the other hand, I think that um, what, what pleasure does, it, it plays an important role in, as you said, to, um, to stop us from the uh, busyness and all the activity that we're involved in. Like a normal pleasure, if you just want to stop and, I don't know, have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something, you know, just to enjoy it for a while, that stops you. And um, that's, in fact, that's, I think, a good example for me because I'm talking about things that are very simple. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can have lunch with a friend and things like that. I no notice how often food is connected with pleasure. And I've often felt that food is important for what you described as a sort of wisdom path or you know, a transcendent uh, point of view. Because um, uh, being able to, to stop and enjoy something simple like that really does uh, draw you into life, you know, what life's about. It's not about how we understand it and do it right, mm. but that we get deep into it and the pleasure will invite us into it. Mm. And yet that runs contrary to so much of what we're taught about spirituality being about disconnection and detachment and not getting too caught up in, in, the, in, the, pleasures of the, uh, in pleasures of the world. Yeah. Well, Mark, I think that you and I both understand that we have to be contrary in order to get anywhere in this business. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Tell me, Tom, is there a relationship between shame and soul? Between pain and soul? Between shame and soul. Shame and soul. Shame. Uh, well, definitely. Shame is a very deep feeling. You know, it's like something that comes over a person and it doesn't seem to have immediate reason. You know, shame. I mean, guilt is another thing. You can be guilty about something that you've done or something that's happened. But shame is, is not so clearly directed at something you've just done. Shame is, uh, is very, goes very deep and, and I think strikes at your identity. I think all of these emotions, things like shame, even guilt, um, all emotions, anger, uh, longing, desire, lust, uh, whatever they are, all of these emotions are really uh, very important for the soul because they are really the, the, the expression of soul or the awareness that soul is present. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's very easy to try to rationalize our emotions and to... Um, not to really fully experience them, you know, to be half in and half out, to, to have a feeling and then judge it as you're going. So many of us judge ourselves, you know, they, and that kind of judgment is not good for the soul. It, it doesn't allow us to feel the emotion. Mm -hmm. So the emotion is really important and shame is one of those, I think that can do a lot for us because it lets us know at a very deep level where we are disconnected or where we, where we, uh, a path that we could still follow and go further and, and benefit. Mm. So how would that relate, for example, to shame around sexuality or sensuality uh, and the desire to yeah. what be wise? Well, see, I don't think, I, I think that shame around sexuality um, is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it's it, it it it's painful. I understand that, and it seems to indicate a lack. Of, well, obviously, it's a lack of comfort, and and but it, it lets you know that there's a that there's a certain direction to go. So if you have your feeling of shame, you, you know, in all my work, what I do as a therapist, I always follow the the rule I got from some of my friends uh, around James Hillman is go with the symptom, go with it. Don't don't 
go against it. Don't try to be contrary to this to the symptom. So if you're feeling shame, the thing to do there is to is to go with it, to move with it, and see where it will take you. Mm. Shame is not a bad thing. It can take you where you, you need to go. Maybe your sexuality needs that where what the shame can can offer. So. Um, mm. It could be that you're not you're not really aware of how how deep your sexuality is and what it's asking of you, and the shame might lead you deeper into it. Actually, uh, it depends how you handle it, you know, what you do with it. But I think that it could be uh, a good thing to go further into. I see. I know what I'm talking about because I was raised a Catholic, <laughs> and. Uh, and I know what shame is around sexuality. I know it. Maybe that's why I write about it because I know it so well. And uh, I know from my own experience that uh, that it helps a great deal to to embrace that shame, to to not to not to reason it away or wish it weren't there, but rather to embrace it. This is who you are, and uh, it definitely has negative side to it, but it can also take you to a very good place. Mm. And that's contrary to what we hear about shame being the 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 onus that has no positive purpose. That it just, yeah. that that is so, sort of like an infection you want to get rid of. Yes, because if you stand back and look at it from a distance, shame doesn't look very good. You know, you look at someone who's feeling some shame, you say, "Why aren't they more comfortable sexually? Why do you know? Why don't they really be more sexual and, and not worry about that shame?" But I don't think it works that way. You are who you are. You know, you like for me, I, I grew up in a family that was not too comfortable with sex. Mm. And uh, so I've got that in me, you know, that's what I, and, and I have to deal with that's who I am. Mm. And the shame is part of it. And the shame lets me then be sexual in my own way. Mm. Great, great. I'd like to talk about the body uh, more deeply. You say that the body changes teach us about fate time nature mortality and character so really the body it sounds like the body is the seat of the soul the body is the oh, yeah. uh, the source of, of of wisdom could you say a little more about that yes one of the reasons why we don't appreciate how how much the body is an expression of soul is that we in general altogether we tend to think of our bodies only physically mm. You know, that's the way we, we deal with uh, medicine. So medicine treats, our, well, if we have a problem, a physical problem, we are treated as oh, almost as though we were this, this, you know, this slab of meat, you know, this, uh, this, this, this object. That's how all medicine is generally, you know? I mean, I'm sure there are some people you and I know that do it differently, but generally speaking, mm. um, uh, physicians are trained to treat the body objectively. And everything you read then is about the body and its chemicals. Mm. And today, for example, um, an awful lot of people, uh, professionals are writing about matters of love and emotion and so on, only from the brain's point of view. Mm. I think that's a terrible thing to do to the body, to talk about the brain as though the soul or the brain. It isn't. The soul is something much more subtle and, and rich and interesting and has to do with meaning. And so if we look at the body that way, that it is a meaningful thing, that, would, that the, the body is not just some suit we're in, you know, some kind of thing that we crawl into to live our lives. We are the body in, in that sense. And so I think if we looked at it that way, that we, um, we might see that the body is more soulful. I always quote William Blake, the English poet, who said, the body is the soul uh, perceived by the senses in our time. Beautiful. That's the that's exact quote from him. So uh, I think that's right. I always keep that in mind. The body is the soul mm. perceived by the senses in our time. So it's the soul you're looking at when you see the body. That makes a big difference. And that's just such a so much more integrated a way of looking at it than yes. than we're we're trained to to do. Without that, we're divided. We're split, and we have this same old thing that's been bothering us for several hundred years at least of uh, splitting the the soul and body. It's it's not a not a good thing to do. No, not a good thing at all. Uh, you talk about um, passion being the essential energy of the soul. Why do you think the passion gets such a bad rep in 
so-called spiritual circles? Passion. Passion. Yeah. Um, well, I'm kind of surprised that it would because there are spiritual passions. You know, people can be very passionate about spiritual things. I think uh, I'm talking about physical passion. I'm talking I, about... I know. But sensitive. passion in general, I think if we could... Yeah, I understand. Um, well, uh, I think that... Um, the, the, the thing about the body and body's passions is that they bring our focus to the world we're in, to our relationship, to our physical desire, longings and needs, and our history, physical history, and so on. Mm. And, uh, and so it seems as though, from a certain point of view, it may seem as though our passions, our sexual passions, take us away from our spiritual goals and, right. and, and hopes and intentions. I don't think that's true. When you start doing that, then you are purchasing your spirituality at the cost of your sexuality or of your body. Mm. That's not a good thing to do. It's, it's very bad because um, the only way to really get along in the spiritual life successfully is, is to be able to do it and live a physical life as well and live in the world. Not, not, it's very easy to be a spiritual person uh, because you want to escape the life in front of you and your physical life. It's very easy. And it's hard to spot that when you're in your spiritual practices, mm -hmm. that you're actually escaping, that you're trying to avoid something. I think that happens much more than we think. It's a very subtle thing. Mm -hmm. So that is not, that what I'm saying is that the, the spiritual practice that is, that is um, attained by repressing your sexual passion is not real, it's not complete because of that, because of what you've done with that. You have to do both. You have to be able to be a person. Who are you anyway? You are a person, you are somebody who has some sexual desire and long ears, sensuality, that's who you are. Do you want to deny who you are in order to pretend that you're spiritual? That doesn't make any sense. So the, the, uh, the task is, and this is where we started, the task is to be able to be really spiritual and at the same time live in a physical world. We have teachers. Uh, I think we have some excellent teachers who can guide us in that way. This is not a new idea. It's possible to be very physical. I think, for example, you know, I, going back to my Catholicism, I, in the past few years I've translated the Gospels. Uh, which is interesting to me because I didn't think I'd go back to my life there, but I did, and I, it made such an impact on me to to find uh, an approach to the Gospels that is not so that is not divided, does not slight the body. And one of the things I it was very clear to me doing this work so closely is that a figure like Jesus is spending his time, um, a lot of his time, cooking and eating. I mean, that's you know, it's very physical. It's a very physical thing. And then he makes the great sacrament of his religion to be bread and wine. Mm. You know, and, and his first, the, the first uh, sign of his transcendence and his spirituality is he transforms, in the story, transforms water into wine mm. at a wedding party. I mean, that's very much what we're talking about. Pleasure in the body. I mean, how many spiritual leaders are worried about getting good wine for a wedding party? You know, that's that to me indicates that um, that we are we have capacity there. But I think what happened was that the uh, followers came along later and, and uh, they transformed the whole thing. They, they ignored that particular point and uh, <laughs> went on to be a moralist. Went on to be what? Moralists. You Moralists, know. right. Well, they, they were uncomfortable by it. They were uncomfortable, so they didn't buy it. They didn't accept the very thing that was, you know, the very teaching that was at the core of it all. Mm. So what I felt, it was important to try to get back to what I, what I see, at least, as uh, the essence of what's going on there. Mm. I love what you say about anger being like an inverted lotus that on the surface you see the unbeautiful parts, but under the water there are gorgeous <laughs> blossoms, and that we need to develop an amphibious eye to appreciate the full meaning of such an unusual flower. And to me, that says something about carnality and sexuality and sensuality as well. 
that that the what appears on, above the surface may be a mess, but yeah. underneath there's something treasure. Absolutely. It's it's uh yeah when you when you think especially about our passions, our as you say, carnality or our spiritual, I mean our sexuality. Um, one question you could ask is, who is it in you that is either afraid of or judgmental about your sexuality? Who is that? Mm. And I think when you begin to, if you could answer that question honestly and really probe it to, so you, you, you know what you're talking about, mm. um, probe it, I mean, for yourself, you know who you are then you may discover that that is a figure from your past, then a self you have been in the past, or it could be a self you have been heavily influenced by somebody else like your parents or, or teachers, or you know, it could be a lot of different people. A lot of people in the spiritual realm, it could be one of their teachers that influences them in a certain way. So when you ask yourself, what is it that stops you from being a really fully sensual spiritual person? Uh, you may find that that person, that figure is up there, you know, way up there somewhere. It's not really you living your life now, but it's somebody else that is kind of joining you, still speaking, because these people do still speak to us and still influence us. And underneath that is this beautiful sexuality, of this life that you could be. But on the surface are all these, these experiences you've had in life, that keep eating away and taking away your, uh, you know, your, uh, pl your pleasure and your uh, peace with your sexuality. So we have, to, we have to examine that and see who it is that's speaking, who it is that's interfering with our attempt to make our, our, uh, our approach to meaning and wisdom to be very much in tune with our sexuality. Mm -hmm. Great, that's great. Uh, you can you talk a little bit about uh, the angel, the beast, and the angel? You say I, uh, that every fall into ignorance and confusion is an opportunity to discover that the beast residing at the center of the labyrinth is also an angel. That's a little bit tied to what you were just saying. Could you elaborate a bit? Sure. Uh, that's that's a great image. I mean, I, well, a great image. I mean, from the Greeks. Yeah. We have this image that there was a labyrinth with the uh, a bull at the center, and um, and that uh, beast was though, his name was Asterion. They called him Asterion, which is a star, or it could be an image of an angel, yeah. So yeah, I think that that's, that's exactly a good image for our sexuality. Um, it's at the core of our being. I think our sexuality is like it's 99% of who we are. You know, it's mm -hmm. there engaged in everything no. in different ways. I don't mean too narrowly, but, uh, but our desire for pleasure, uh, our being in our body and responding to our body sensations, mm -hmm. um, uh, wanting physical uh, pleasure during a day is simple things I was talking about at the beginning. A uh, cup of coffee or, you know, it doesn't take much. Uh, just little feeling the sunshine on your body, you know, that kind of thing. It's all so important to be able to feel yourself as a physical person. Mm. But they get the, the sexuality is in our society, especially, or maybe it's always among human beings, is that the, um, we are afraid of it. It might take us uh, in places that we're afraid to go to. It may uh, be hard to deal with, difficult to, uh, to moderate and uh, to live, find living arrangements for it. Uh, relationships can be difficult. Sexual relationships can, can be difficult. So there are lots of things that make the sex look like this beast that's at the center of the labyrinth. Mm. And it does look like a beast because it is, it's, you know, people talk about it as animal. Yeah. You know, my animal sexuality, you know, it's my animal side or something. Yeah. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. It's your angel side. It is, so, it is so, so connected to the meaning and the delight of being a human being. Mm -hmm. And it is so connected to being able to express yourself not only to a sex, sexual partner, but also to every other person you encounter in the world, by being there with some intimacy and some pleasure, and maybe some even to the extent you can touch, even though today we have a lot of trouble with that. We have trouble with that whole Venusian realm altogether. And mm -hmm. so um, I think that's really what 
uh, our relationship, the relationship between men and women, where it is having some problems today, especially, is uh, it's not just working that out between the genders, but also, but really about how do I get my my uh, sexuality and my physical body with its delights and and wishes and desires? How do I get that to be so connected to my values and to being in the world in a positive way that I don't I don't go around with a great deal of anxiety about it. Mm. That's a very difficult thing. In fact, I wonder if it's possible to do that today, mm. given our complexes and our, our uh, neuroses about it today. Mm. And isn't part of that our discomfort with dark with the darkness and dark in general that we see the the uh, the angel through this scrim of darkness. And that makes it into a it makes it into a, a beast. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the dark and an appreciation of the dark in self knowledge? Well, it's, it's, uh, darkness can be relative, first of all. So, what's dark for some people is bright for others. I mean, it's it's there is an element. Some things there are some things we share that we know are dark, uh, violence and things like that. They're pretty dark. Maybe there are some people who enjoy it, but that's that's pretty crazy. Uh, so uh, there's a darkness that um, that's part of life, and uh, it's so it's, you know it's silly to say that it's, it's so obvious, so so obvious that. But certainly part of our work uh, on ourselves, which is something we have to do, by the way, it's something that that we we are not naturally okay you know we we've all had influences and experiences that have made us uh, somewhat neurotic we are all neurotic in some way so we have work to do to try that's it's like raw raw material the alchemists called it prima materia raw material mm -hmm. that is the stuff of becoming somebody so we have that raw material to work with and it is dark to us it's our darkness mm -hmm. as i said in my own experience just to mention that my growing up in a wonderful family but who were not comfortable with sex sex became dark you know the darkness something very hard to just own up to and just be it taken a lot of work and uh, so um i think uh, i think for a lot of people uh, sexuality anger you brought that up before anger can be part of that darkness they don't you know they don't want to be angry and yet the more they repress their anger the worse it gets and it, may turn into rage and so um that's something um trying to some people try too hard i think to be virtuous mm. they think that being full of virtue is what they're supposed to be doing and that image that sense of self that's all virtuous um cre creates a huge uh, uh un hidden shadow and uh, it's, it's very hard to trust someone who's who's so interested in being virtuous because they haven't brought that shadow as another color. You know, when some people are talking to me about metaphors for shadow, uh, what I often think of is putting pepper in a recipe. It's like it's, it's something dark, but you, 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 make, you mix it in so much. It's, it's not like, it's not like a, a, a cookie that half of it is chocolate and half of it is white or vanilla or whatever. It's not like that. It's like a casserole that has pepper in it. Mm. So you have that darkness, and it it just it enters the whole the whole thing, and it gives it some spice, and you don't really even see it when it's there, but it's there. And you may taste it. I think that's what shadow is like. If we could bring it into our lives, and I think we tend to uh, like right and wrong and two opposites. It's not an opposite. It's it's a seasoning of life that really makes us real, makes us real people. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, you say something about repression and uh, and virtue that that a real virtue can't be bought with repression. That real virtue is the rare the rare innocence that comes from taking life on and owning your passions. Yes, that's what, right. What do you mean in that context by innocence? By innocence. Well, I do I do think that uh, especially Americans uh, have this issue that um they want to be innocent uh, you know they that's that's like a goal somehow to 
they, they like to feel innocent about, like if we do something even collectively, if our government does something that's pretty horrible, we, we try to do it in a way that we maintain our innocence. What does that even mean? Other countries are, 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 uh, are evil or they're able to, they say, we think are, are just evil and identify with being evil and we don't. We try to be innocent no matter what. And that, that is not real innocence. Real innocence, I think, is more uh, being who you, who you need to be. If you need to be tough sometimes in your relationships, which is necessary in your business, uh, if you need to be less than truthful sometimes, and I think we all get to that place at times, mm. um, then uh, we take that out, we recognize it, and we're willing to do it. And we're willing to, to take the consequences, and we're willing to be seen as someone who is not one of these obviously innocent people. We have to give that up. Give that up. There's some, there's some kind of reward in that feeling innocent. I'm I'm not guilty of anything, you know, that's that feeling. Rather than to take it on and say, yes, it, you know, I had to do that, or this is who I have to be, this is who I am, I can't really change that. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be that kind of a person who is not so, not so, not so great and, and uh, not so uh, pure, you know, and uh, uh, that, that, that then creates a real innocence. I think real innocence is then as someone who has limits on, on what they do. Their shadow is limited. Uh, they don't act it out all over the place. People who are innocent can act on it and don't even know they're doing it because their their feeling of innocence is like a bright, a bright light that just doesn't let them see their shadow. Mm -hmm. A lot of people you know, are doing terrible things to each other all the time and they still feel innocent because they don't, they're not even aware they're being that way. Right. So they're, they're, there's an achievement of a kind of mature, innocence, uh, a knowing, sophisticated innocence, where you are truly uh, someone who goes about the world doing the best you can, but knowing you, you can't do it perfectly, and you're not aiming for that perfection. Mm. There's real humility in that innocence. Yeah, there's a kind of, kind of a real solid humility. It's, it's, again, humility can be a pose that some people take because they, they, they don't feel they should be somebody you know, who has some influence and power and needs and, and desires, that kind of thing. Uh, so real humility comes from being like the rest of us, being an ordinary human being, plan B person, you know, not, not, the, not the top mm -hmm. variety, but somebody a little bit lower on the chain. Right, right, right. Great. I, I just have a couple more questions. You, you talk about one function of love being to cure us of an anemic imagination. I think that's such a powerful phrase, a life emptied of romantic attachment and abandoned to reason. How do we suffer from an anemic imagination? What are some of the symptoms of that? And how can we address that? An anemic imagination is, I mean, imagination hasn't been developed and tried. It's like you, you, don't, you, don't, uh, you don't imagine life. You don't have a broad imagination of what life could be or who you could be. Instead, you might try to be like the person you, their parents always wanted you to be. I, you know, as a therapist, I can tell you, and I, I'm sure you know, Mark, that so many people are still, even in their 50s and 60s, trying to be who their parents wanted them to be and still following those parental rules and expectations. That's, that doesn't, that, that's a clear indication. There isn't much imagination about who you can be. It's, it's the, imi the image, the image you, that guides your life is limited to this thing you were taught at a certain point in your life, mm -hmm. and you never grew out of it. You, know, you never really made an attempt to break out of it. So that's, um, that's what, one thing I mean by a lack of imagination. And other things would be that as you go then, as you go through life, what you can do as you, as you study life, this is something that the big thing for me is that so many people don't move anywhere. They just doing the same thing day after day and they don't see that maybe they could de they could develop as a person mm. as a person i know a lot of people go to spiritual teachers to become you know to learn how to meditate better mm. I, i'm at a different level i i that that doesn't impress me a whole lot I, what impresses me is somebody who can look at the way they live and become more more interesting more complicated Mm. Uh, a richer person as you go and your soul then comes forward to color who you are rather than to 
be that same old person or to be aiming at something that an image that you have for yourself that's all you know limited to your own concept that's who you want to be that that is not really what it's about it's about expanding and entering an unknown world and an unknown self where you really become somebody you didn't know you could be and that that is that all, that all comes from a bigger imagination that's stretching all the time mm -hmm. beautiful and just one last question i'd like to ask you about mysticism <laughs> and uh, you say that mysticism is a simple quality of everyday life, which is contrary to what most people think. Uh, and in that simplicity lies its beauty and its importance. Wonder tears open an otherwise closed cosmos. Could you just say a few words about how does wonder, how do awe tear open the closed cosmos? It doesn't take much to be a mystic. Um... I think that it starts by uh, getting up in the morning and looking at the sun or feeling the sunshine, uh, checking out those clouds, what they're doing, um, especially the sky. You know, the, this is in all teachings that the sky is one of the first places you can find your, your mystical self. Hmm. So, or at night, to looking at the stars. It sounds so trite maybe, but that's something that you could really do and make an effort to go to a place where you can really see that night sky. Mm. And so uh, that's one thing that can be done. I think it can also, your mysticism can also be found in cooking, where you uh, uh, let yourself be absorbed with the, these natural materials that you're working with, with food, and you, mm. you don't have to make a big deal of it. You just, you just do it. And, but you have some awareness along the line that you are somebody who is going to extend your sense of yourself and your, every day in, through ordinary ways. And I know I was a monk for a number of years, 13 years, and, and uh, I know that for us, the physical world was really our, it's like our ladder to the mystical heights. You know, the ordinary things, taking walks was part of our life. Uh, being in the library, reading books and studying was part of our mystical life. I, I spent a lot of time in Ireland. You know, the Irish monks were very good at this, that for them, be, being a monk was lo a lot about study and about reading and writing. That was, and as a writer myself, I see that's part of my mysticism. If it depends how I do it, of course. If I do it to try to make a difference in the world, that's, that's more mystical than just writing to make some, a, a few dollars. You know, that's a whole different thing. Mm. So it depends on what your orientation is, but you could make your whole life uh, quite mystical easily. And, and that means, that, you know, I'm describing wonder. Uh, you know, I'm not only about the great magnificent things like the sky, but about like a, a, an omelet, you know, that, that what a fantastic thing. And I, I was looking, making an egg the other day and I thought, wow, this is probably the best image for the sun. This is solar life brought down to my breakfast. You know, this is the sun right here in this frying pan. Uh, so uh, I think if you have that idea, if you can connect, this is an old, old teaching, as above, so below. Uh, you bring that world of the upper world that's so mysterious and mystical, bring it down to your everyday experiences. And that is the way to live a mystical life. You don't do it by just losing yourself up there in some extended notion of cosmos. You do it by being so connected to your daily life, you see a connection between the vast infinite infinity of your life and the most particular thing in your daily life. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tom. <laughs> it's always it's such a pleasure to talk to you. you know, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Mark. Thing, you know, I, I can talk to you. Things happen. At it's really great so i'm always happy to do that thank you sir so have, have a have a wonderful day and i'll talk to you again soon i hope i hope so wishing thank you all the best bye thank you too bye bye